Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on, rise as we're able. Lord Father God, I just want to thank you so much for another wonderful Sunday morning to be able to be here in the presence of you with our brothers and sisters, to be able to worship you, Lord Father God. We thank you for a wonderful sunny morning. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us throughout the week, and we ask that you will continue to bless and protect us, Lord Father God. And Holy Spirit, I invite you to come right now so that we can just feel the presence of you so heavily, that we can feel the grace and mercy that is new every day. Help us to be able to feel the love and be so blessed by the truth as we trust in you and all that we do, that your plans are far greater than ours. And as we look upon you and as we sing these praises unto you, help us to remember the miracles that we see on a daily basis, Lord Father, that it always comes from you. We trust in you. We love you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. me how cause I can't explain it's nothing short of a miracle I'm here I've got some blessings that I don't deserve I've got some scars but that's how you learn it's nothing short of a
of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. every other name.
sing holy there is no one
Thank you for gathering us together this morning. Thank you for allowing us to worship you and give you thanks as a church. We don't take being able to worship here on Sundays for granted and we love that you speak to us every day and we have access to you every day, but there is nothing like coming to church and worshiping you with friends and family and making new friends and welcoming new people because we all need you and we are stronger together. We're three or more gathered together with a church full of us, Lord, and we're here to worship you, give you thanks, cast our cares on you. Some of us may have come in with heavy hearts or pressure of different things, and, but we made it, Lord, and we know we get to give that to you. So we ask that you just fill us with the Holy Spirit. Bless the word today. May it touch all of us deeply that we want to go out and share with other people and tell everybody about the word. We love you, Lord, and we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Good morning. God is in this place. Amen. He's here so strong. I don't know if you can feel it the way I feel it, but I, I'm not sure I'll be able to preach today because the hand of God is so strong in this place. And if you're feeling that, you know, sometimes we get into a situation where we feel something. I want to let you know that's not just your emotions. Your emotions are responding to something real, and that is the reality of God's presence in this place. Amen? So we'll see if I can get through this message, but I believe God has a word for us today. Uh, we're taking a pause on the series in the book of Proverbs to talk about membership for, five, uh, for the next five messages. And so if you're interested, what does it mean to be a member of a church? What, is, what does it mean to be a member of this church? Uh, that's what we're gonna cover for the next five messages. And then if you'd like to be a member, uh, let me know. You can come up to me or email me at steve at cardiachurch.org and let me know that you're interested in becoming a member of the church. And we will have a um, service on Easter Sunday. So, so that, I mean, it's an it's a important topic because I think um, we're experiencing and have been experiencing um, kind of a deinstitutionalizing in America of a lot of things. Membership in pretty much every organization is down, except maybe Costco. Costco continues to do well. But uh, Rotary Club, Kiwanis, you know, Lions, all, the, all these service organizations have experienced year after year drop in membership. And not only service organizations, but churches, especially mainline churches, have experienced year after year decline in membership. And I think part of it is just this general deinstitutionalizing in America where people are just not really, we don't really think of it as really important to be a member of something, right? And also just people are busier than ever. We just don't have enough time to do all these things, to, be, to belong to five different things. And so we're picking and choosing um, where we commit. And that's a good thing. It's also a good thing that people are realizing it's not just about having your name on a membership roster somewhere. That if there's no real experience with that membership, then it really doesn't mean anything, right? Yeah, to just, just to have your name 
on some club's roster. You know, it might have meant something in the past to say, yeah, I'm a member of the Rotary Club. Maybe there was some prestige or maybe that got you access uh, to certain things. But now, people don't really care. They're, they're not as impressed if you're a member of the Rotary Club or if you're a member of this church or that church. So, so in general, like, there's this deinstitutionalizing, and some of it's good, some of it's negative. Um, but we're going to talk about what it means to be a member, why it's important. Um, I think about... I think about the commitment aspect of that. And so I, I just remember my wedding day. Some of you are married. Maybe you remember your wedding day. Um, as somebody who hated to be the center of attention uh, or, to, or to be up front in public, that was a terrifying day, my wedding day, to be on a big stage at, at, at a big church with 500 people in attendance and everybody looking at hopefully my wife more than me. But I, I just, I was terrified. It was nerve-wracking. I was sweating so much during the ceremony. Uh, the pastor probably wondered if I was going to actually go through with it. Um, but, but then th there was this sacred moment, though, that I remember vividly is, is our vows. And some of you remember giving your vows. I didn't, we didn't write our vows. We just said whatever was in the book. But it was so impactful. You know, when you think about those words, when you think about saying, you know, I'm committed to you for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. That was a sacred moment. And I had this understanding that um, I was saying those, those vows and she was saying those vows to me in the presence of God. And it just felt like it was just the pastor, her and me, just saying those vows to each other. And to this day, I think about those vows. To this day, I think about, yeah, that's, that's my commitment to my wife and, that's, and I know that's her commitment to me. And I can't tell you how powerful that is, how strong that is. That, that our relationship is not based on how we feel about each other on any given moment. It's not based on uh, how well our lives are going. It doesn't go up and down. I mean, we have bad days and good days, right? That's why it says for better or for worse. But there's so much strength in knowing that I'm committed to her and she's committed to me no matter what, that our relationship is not circumstantial. It's not based on circumstances. It's based on a commitment, a promise, one that we will keep till death, God willing. And so, and so there's so much power in that. And, and the older I get and the more health problems I have, the more precious those vows are to me, that uh, there, are, there are now more sickness than health sometimes. And and um, it's powerful. There's so much power in, in commitment. There's so much power in commitment. And, and in a society that's becoming less committed to everything, where everything now is circumstantial, it's like based on how I feel on every given moment, where our relationships, our friendships, our, our jobs, you know, it's just based on how we, do, do we like it? Do we not like it? Let me shop around. There's so much power in knowing I'm not shopping around. My wife is not shopping around. And, and so, so what's interesting about membership and marriage, that they're related in the United Methodist Church in that both membership in a church and marriage are both based on the baptism covenant. And the baptismal covenant is this promise, this agreement between God and us, and between us and one another to say, we're committed to you, God, but more importantly, God, you're committed to us and in a, in a way that's indestructible. And there's so much power in that. There's so much power in commitment. And I want us to rediscover that as, as modern-day, you know, Americans in, in a deinstitutionalized society where membership, commitment, these things are fading away. I want the church to rediscover the power of commitment. Because what we're doing together, the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus, is to be salt and light in a world that is hurting and dying. And it's so important that the mission of the church is so important. And you, if you're a member, you're a missionary. You're not here to, you're not a customer of religious goods and services. If you're a member of a church, you're a missionary. You're on mission. We're on mission together. And I want to know that when I'm in the foxhole, 
When I'm in the battle, the spiritual battle, because it's a spiritual battle, I wanna know that when I look to my right and to my left and I see my brother and my sister, that I can count on them. That we're not all just here at our convenience, amen? We're not just, we're just, we're not just here shopping around for a church that ticks all our boxes, but that, that there is a sense of our membership, our commitment to one another is deeper than that. It's, it's based on God's commitment to us. And that, that when we believe in Jesus, we're one with one another in a way that's, that's powerful and permanent. So I want to rediscover that. Um, to be a member of the church, just some nitty gritty things. Number one, you have to be a baptized believer in Jesus. That's our first membership requirement at Cardia and at every United Methodist Church. And, and number two, there are these five areas that we all commit to. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And today, we're going to talk about prayer. So that was my little intro about membership. Now we're going to get into the, the main topic, which is prayer. Prayer is our first duty as members of the church. And so we're going to look at uh, the scriptures, 2 Chronicles 7, 11 through 16. It says, when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. So Solomon built this incredible temple. It was, it was gold covered inside. Um, he used all the most precious stones and metals and, and jewels to adorn this, this temple. And, um, and he dedicated it. He dedicated it to God. And the previous chapter is his prayer of dedication. And, it, and as he dedicates the temple, he cries out to God, God, you know, we're probably going to mess up. We're, we're probably going to take some detours. We're probably not going to be faithful to you all the time. Um, and, and so my prayer, Solomon, is praying that, that when that happens, when we mess up, when we go astray, and when, and when judgment comes against us, my prayer is that, that when your people pray in this temple, towards this temple, that you'll hear and forgive. And so this is God's response to say, yes, um, Solomon, I hear your prayer, and when people mess up, they go in exile, and there's plagues and pestilence. If they'll pray, if they'll humble themselves and pray, I will hear. This is a powerful promise. I don't know if you, you ever do computer programming, but there are if-then statements in programming. I don't know if you knew that, but you know, if this, then that. If this happens, if this condition is met, then this result will happen. And so God gives this powerful if-then statement. You know, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. This is a promise in scripture. Prayer. Prayer is the first duty of a member of of Cardia and the first job of the church. And what I find very cool, startling even, about this verse is that who's the one praying and who's the one being healed? It says, if my people will pray, then I will heal their land. If my people will pray, I will heal their land. How many of you know that, that our land needs healing right now? 
there's some weird stuff going on. I was driving around LA yesterday and it was hailing. I'm not superstitious, but maybe it's the end of the world. I don't know. It's hailing in, in Los Angeles, it's snowing in LA County, and um, things are changing. The climate's changing. There are continue to be wars and rumors of wars. I don't know if you've noticed in the past three years, but we've also been through pestilence. We've literally been through pestilence uh, with COVID. I, I'm not sure what else God is going to have to do to get our attention. And I, I think there's this, this theology which shies away from saying that any kind of thing that happens in weather or the climate, that, that's not God, it's just coincidence. But if you look at scripture, all throughout scripture, there's evidence that God causes changes in weather. And that's not to say every negative thing that happens, every earthquake is a judgment. That's also wrong because things happen. And we never want to like condemn people and say, it's your fault that this happened. But when negative things happen in the world, in the climate, in you know, natural things, it's, it's always a wake up call to God's people to say, huh, maybe we should pray. Maybe we should humble ourselves. Maybe it is us. Maybe, maybe it is something that we need to repent of. But we're, we're living in unprecedented times, people. Things are happening that are crazy, that are weird, that are, it should, it should wake us up. It should, it should do something in us where we're like, this is not normal. And we shouldn't just keep going as if everything is normal. Things are not normal. Things are happening. It should be a wake-up call. And this land needs healing. Our society needs healing. The climate needs healing. Our economy needs healing. Our politics need healing. Churches need healing. There is so much brokenness in the world right now. And, and you know what? God is not waiting for the world to pray. God is not waiting for the world to pray. It's so easy to, to blame people when they're suffering and to, and to just kind of say, well, you better pray about it. You know, if, if you have family members that are sick and you see like they're constantly going through trouble and you're like, man, they must not be praying enough. God's not waiting for them to pray. God's waiting for you to pray. It says, if my people who are called by my name will pray, then I will heal their land. God isn't waiting for unbelievers to become believers. God isn't waiting for Satanists to convert and then he's going to heal America. God is waiting for his church to pray. Because it's when God's people pray, that's when God heals our land. And why is that? It's because, it's because the church, Christians, we have this incredible, incredible privilege. I want to talk about the privilege we have to pray right now. Because sometimes we underestimate, we don't realize how much privilege we have, how much privilege we're sitting on and not using. And so I'm just going to go through three, three little verses. And these are not going to be up there, so... Um, the first one's Matthew 7:11. Matthew 7:11. I call this the convenience store verse, um, because like 7:11, it's always open. And it, but it's it's a, it's incredible. Okay, it says Matthew 7:11. If you then, this is Jesus talking to the people listening to him. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who, ha who ask him? If you who are evil, as evil as you are, when it comes Christmas time, you don't give your children coal. You give your children good gifts. How much more will your Father who is good give good gifts to his children who ask him? So this is the 7-Eleven verse. Like it's, it's like your dad owns 7-Eleven. And you can walk in there at any time and you get whatever you want. I know God is not a vending machine. He's not a convenience store. 
That probably offends people to call it that, but, but just remember Matthew 7, 11. That's a promise for you. If you're a child of God, God will give you every good thing you ask for. Every good thing you ask for. Um, so that's one privilege. Then we have, we have the promise of the Son. So that's the promise of the Father. This is the promise of the Son in John 16, 23. Jesus is talking to his disciples and saying, in that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So we already, as children of God, we already have access to God. We have the privilege to pray. But, but as Christians, as those who are under the name of Jesus Christ, now we have the access of the Son to the Father. We have the same access to God in prayer as Jesus has. So that's another level of privilege, right? That when we ask in the name of Jesus, that means if we are asking as if we were representing Jesus to the Father, then God will give us whatever we ask in the name of Jesus. And, and finally, there's this um, promise in Matthew 18, 19. And this is the promise of the Holy Spirit in the church, in the fellowship of the church. This is, this is the power of agreement. And this is like dynamite. It says, again, truly I tell you, Matthew 18, 19, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So that's the power of agreement. If two Christians gathered in the name of Jesus agree on anything to ask the Father, it will be done for them. So we have these three incredible promises and privileges. The, the, the promise of the father, that he's a good, good father who will give good gifts to his children. The promise of the son, that when we ask in the name of Jesus, it will be done for us. And the power of the presence, the, the power of agreement that says when two of us agree in the name of Jesus on anything, it will be done for us. So the church is sitting on these incredible promises in prayer. We're just sitting on it. We're just sitting on it. The world is dying. Everything is going to hell in a handbasket. And the church is sitting on the th three greatest promises of prayer and scripture. We're just sitting on it. And so... <clears throat> That's our first duty. My, my, my hope is that there would be a, a movement of prayer in our church, in our church. Um, you know, a praying church is a powerful church, but a, a prayerless church is a powerless church. What would it look like for this church to learn how to pray, to learn to really learn how to pray? I believe that if even one church, if say even our church learned how to pray the way that God has given us access, I believe it would transform our city. I believe Los Angeles would be transformed. Amen, amen. amen. That's what happens when every revival began as a prayer, a prayer meeting. Every revival began as a prayer meeting, including the one in Asbury University right now. It was, a, it was a worship service, and then people just stayed to pray. And now over 20,000 people are, are like crowding that whole area to pray. So um, I think in, in the modern-day church, we often emphasize our works, you know, what we do. We talk a lot about what we do, and that's important. Um, I, I, I say, you know, when, when we work, God approves but when we pray, God moves. And we need both, right? When we work, God approves. He's like, good job. You did that. Good job. But when we pray, God moves. He's like, all right, step aside. You did good. Let me show you what I can do. And in this tidal wave, this tsunami of the power of God can sweep through a city. When, when God's people pray, not when, not when people out there pray, but when people at church pray. 
So we're going to explore that. We're going to have a chance to pray uh, a little bit later on. But, but let's stop there and let's take a moment to pray. God, we are often so weak in prayer, whether it's because we think we can handle it, which is not true, or we can do it, which we can do some things, God, but we can't do what the world needs us to do. Lord, or whether we think we just don't have time to pray or we're just not knowledgeable enough to pray. We think we don't know how to pray. But your eyes are on your temple and, and we know that today it's not just the building of the temple, but it's the people of God that you inhabit and that your eyes are on. But you're looking at us and your eyes are on us and your ears are open and it's like you're straining to hear the prayers of your church. And God, we ask for your forgiveness if, if, if you just hear like this quiet, barely audible whisper. And we pray, God, that you would teach your church to cry out. I want you to hear a loud cry from heaven, God. I want you to hear the outcry of your people. And so stir in our hearts, stir in your church even right now, teach us, begin to move in our spirits to stir us up, to make us dissatisfied with the status quo and to give us faith to envision and hope and, and believe for more than what we're experiencing. Stir up a passion for prayer. Stir up a, a compulsion to pray. Stir up, bring us to our knees, God. You said, if my people will humble themselves, bring us to our knees, God. Help us to not be so proud to think that we can handle the mess we've created. We can't, Father God. We can't. We don't know what to do. We've, we've gone past the point of no return. We've, we've ruined things to the point where it's going to take a miracle to, to get things back even to the way they were, let alone to make progress. God, all our hope in in exceptionalism, human exceptionalism, or even our technology and our science, as good as they can be, often bring about negative consequences we haven't foreseen. And so humble us, God, to realize that if left to our own devices, we'll do some good and then we'll make a big mess. Humble us, God. Bring us to our knees. Teach us how to cry out. It's not the words. You're not looking for fancy words as a mother would respond to the, just the cry of their infant, all you're looking for is the cry of our hearts. So teach us even just how to cry out, how to cry out for our land, to cry out for our neighbors, to cry out for our city, to cry out for our nation. When your church learns how to cry out, you will hear and you will move and you will forgive and you will heal. We believe that. We claim these promises today. Teach us how to pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to continue to pray. I want to invite the praise team to come and help us to worship a bit, and then we'll have some more time to pray as a body. Feel free to stand as you're able so we can worship together. So worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus the name. Jesus the name above every other name. Jesus the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. Holy, there is no one like you. 
I want to invite you to have a seat. Um, I want to invite our sister Esther Kim to come up and she's going to share um, just her thoughts on prayer. So let's receive her with uh, a welcome applause.
how holy God is and how holy, like how much honor he deserves and how much, hope, like he's so holy. It's not that he's, it's just, you know, he's not mad at us. He's just holy. He just cannot be around the, the, the grime. You know, it's just him. It's just he, like, for me, I don't like being around like old. You know, <laughs> it's just like mold. Like you don't want to be around. You can't be around it because it's not good for your health. So that's how God's like holiness is. It's just he. It's not that he doesn't want to be there. Be there. It's just he's just he can't be there. He can't tolerate it because of his holiness. So my posture has even prayed and it is, has even changed throughout um, this re realization. And then there's also been really. A lot of joyous times, a lot of really, really like good moments of God, where he, like the skies are brighter, the colors are just more vibrant. You know, it's just everything is just people are prettier, they're better looking. You know, it's just like they're nicer. You know, it's just been so great. Um, and then, um, so the holiness, uh, I, you know. Uh, verse that I refer to and that really like opened my eyes was Revelations 4, 8 through 11 where everybody, you know, is like just just bowing down and praying and praying and saying, holy, holy, you know, is, is, um, is he almighty, Lord God almighty. And all they do is worship and pray and that is the highest honor. And I actually had a problem with this because I was like, I don't want to live my life, you know, just doing that all the time. And I realized that that is the highest honor that we could ever receive as Christians. So, um, and then, sorry, I thought it was going to be short. Um, prayer to me is also me giving God the reins to care for everything I care for, uh, no matter how big or small. Prayer allows me to draw close to God so I can hear Him and listen for what He cares about for me. And so, you know, First Peter 5, 7, 8, it's cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to de devour. And so, you know, I, I have this vision in my mind when we have a prayer or we have an anxiety or something that, you know, is bothering us. You know, I really literally think, like, casting it. You know, like when we cast a net into the into the water, my fisherman cast a net into the water. Like we don't want to hold on to it at all. We just cast it out there. You know, so it's like don't carry it. And so lastly, it's you know my opportunity to get in sync with God. And you know because He promises promises us that His burden is light and His yoke is easy. So when He gives us all these promises that I don't have to carry on any of these things, it's just. You know, it's just easy for me to live this life, be in His presence at all times, and be able to just live out what He's called me to do. Live out the person that He's allowed me to be. And so, lastly, the verse, the verse is Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It's come to me, who all of you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then take upon my yoke, so you guys can.